Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the model diagnosis and treat your research problems uh, research presentation webinar session seven. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Iona Safa. She's a new graduate uh, from St. Paul Hospital Media Medical College, and she is going to present her internship paper on practice of infant sunlight exposure among mothers attending St. Paul Hospital Media Medical College OPD. Um, an institution-based cross-sectional study, which was done in 2023. Uh, uh, as a reviewer from the clinical side, we have Dr. Abata. Uh, I'm sure you all know him. He's an associate professor of pediatrics and child health, uh, a subspecialist in pediatric pulmonology and critical care um, um, field. And he's currently working at St. Paul Hospital Minium Medical College at the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, he has a very good uh, experience in research and uh, definitely he will inspire you as a clinician and researcher. Um, and uh, it's glad to have you uh, here today, Dr. Abata. And for the research part, I will be doing the review. My name is Tegist and I am the founder and general manager of Medical Research Lounge. Uh, thank you everyone for coming here today. So the rest of the review will be done by the the audience, so we expect you to drop your questions in the chat box and we'll get to it uh, at the end of the presentation. So we'll give uh, Dr. Zihon uh, 15 minutes to present her research and we'll go to the review by starting from Dr. Rabata and then I'll proceed and we will give you uh, the audience time to reflect your ideas. Uh, so um, Dr. Zihon, you can start presenting. Uh, thank you again. Um, Dr. Zion, uh, <clears throat> uh, your sound is more fault. Maybe if you are using an earphone, it's better to disconnect it. Is it audible, my voice? Yes, now it's 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 great. You can proceed. Okay, thank you for giving me this chance. And once again, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, a paper I did as an intern, uh, like uh, eight months ago. Uh, the title is Practice of Infant uh, Satellite Exposure Among Mothers attending St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College, an institution-based uh, cross-sectional study. So as an introduction, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, which helps in the absorption of uh, calcium and phosphorus. Calcium and phosphorus are very essential in uh, bone strength and uh, muscle contraction in other uh, metabolic functions of the body. So there are a few natural dietary sources of vitamin D, like the fish, cheese, liver, and egg yolks, and sometimes some mushrooms. Uh, most children in the industrialized countries and economically well-developed countries uh, receive uh, vitamin D. Uh, they are fortified foods and the breast milk has a very low uh, vitamin D content. So uh, ketone synthesis is normally the most important natural source of vitamin D, especially in resource limited areas like uh, our country. So it depends on sunlight exposure, the UV radiation that comes from uh, sunlight converting the 7 dehydrocholesterol into vitamin D3. So early morning uh, sunlight exposure of infants is a very good practice in order to prevent vitamin D deficiency and other health problems that come with it. So as an objective, the objective of this study was to assess the level of practice of infant sunlight exposure and factors associated with it amongst mothers who visit the St. Paul's Hospital uh, Pediatric uh, OPD. Uh, the study design was institution-based cross-sectional study design, and it was conducted in St. Paul's Hospital, uh, Gulali Subcity at uh, Ethiopia. So the study population, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was mothers of children aged below the year, uh, below one year of age, uh, who visit the St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College Pediatric OPD from uh, 20, uh, February 20 to uh, March 20 during the time of data collection of the study. So the sampling technique was ram uh, simple random sampling technique. 
So uh, on the sample size calculation, uh, using the single proportion uh, formula, taking the prevalence of 84.7% uh, uh, taken from a study done in Jumma, Ethiopia, and the confidence inter interval of 95% uh, and a margin of error of 5%. Uh, so this was adjusted with the population cor uh, correction formula. So the result initially became 168, which uh, after the above uh, correction formula, the final size became 156. And then considering a 10% of uh, non-response rates, the final result became 171. So coming to the operational uh, definitions, adequate sunlight exposure, uh, in this case, a good practice was defined as uh, sunning of neonates starting from the age of two weeks, uh, 15 to 20 minutes per day from uh, 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, during the day. So the infant's eyes should be covered and uh, the genitalia should also be covered if the infant is male. And no ointment should be used before or uh, during sunning. So poor sunlight exposure or poor practice in this uh, research was defined as uh, any practice of uh, infant sunlight exposure that does not fulfill the above criteria. Uh, good attitude was uh, defined as uh, an attitude of a mother uh, who responded five uh, or more of the questions that are under the attitude section of the questionnaire correctly. And those who responded uh, less than five uh, of the questions under the attitude section were termed as uh, mothers having poor attitude. Uh, good knowledge, uh, um, mothers who responded to six uh, or more of the questions under the, for the uh, knowledge section of the questionnaire correctly were termed as uh, mothers with good knowledge and poor knowledge. Mothers who responded uh, less than six of the questions under the knowledge section of the questionnaire correctly were termed that way. So eligibility criteria, uh, all mothers of uh, uh, children aged below the age of uh, one year uh, who visited the pediatric opedia at the time of the uh, data collection were included and there were no participants uh, that were excluded for any kind of reason. So data collection and quality assurance, the data was collected using a structured interviewer administered questionnaire. This questionnaire was developed from a, a previous literature of a similar studies and adjusted according to the objectives of the study. And the data collected, uh, the data was collected using with uh, trained data collectors who were St. Paul's, uh, Paul's Millennium Medical College medical students. So coming to the results uh, on the socio-demographic characteristics of the respondents, uh, total of 171 uh, participants were uh, responded to the questionnaire, making a response rate of 100%. The mean age of the participants were 28.55 years, and majority of the participants, up to 48%, were orthodox, the remaining constituting uh, Protestant, Muslim, and Catholic. Uh, up to 26.3% of the participants were single mothers and up to 64.9% were uh, married. A small proportion was contributed by the widowed, separated and the divorced mothers. Uh, up to 50.3% of the participants were rural, uh, were from rural area and the remaining uh, from uh, urban areas. And uh, the coming to their educational uh, status, uh, up to 25.7% were illiterate and up to 31% uh, had educational status of secondary school or above. And uh, the occupation up to 32.2% uh, uh, were unemployed and the remaining uh, in government or uh, private sector employees. So... Uh, up to 76.6% of the mothers had a regular had no regular uh, ANC follow-up during their pregnancy, and 23.4% had a regular follow-up. Uh, up to 69.9% had a health uh, daily. Uh, had a place of delivery uh, registered as a health facility, and 30.4 de delivered at home. So coming to the practice of the infants, sunlight exposure, 81.3% uh, of the participants uh, exposed their infants to sunlight, but only a 
about 29.2% uh, of them expose their, their children to sunlight for seven days a week, and up to 28.1% started uh, exposing their infants to sunlight at the age of uh, two weeks of uh, age or less. Uh, so 48.5% of the participants used uh, ointment uh, during uh, or uh, before uh, sunlight exposure of their infants. And 17.3% uh, uh, of the participants covered their body, uh, the bodies of their infants properly during sunlight exposure. So in general calculated, uh, up to 47.4% uh, of the uh, participants had a uh, good practice of infant sunlight exposure. So coming to the attitude, uh, up to 49.1% of the study population had a good uh, attitude. 82.4% believed that sunlight exposure was advantageous and 22% uh, believed uh, that uh, sunlight exposure was disadvantageous. Uh, so these are the questions that were included under the attitude uh, section of the questionnaire with their uh, respective responses, with their frequencies and percentages. So knowledge about uh, infant sunlight exposure, up to 81.3% of the study participants claim to know the advantages of uh, sunlight exposure, but uh, only 43.8% of them had uh, good knowledge about sunlight exposure. So 42.7% of them uh, believed that sunlight, infants should be exposed to sunlight seven days a week, and only 33%, 33.9% uh, believed uh, that uh, it should be started at the age of uh, two weeks. So in this table are uh, the questions that were included under the knowledge section of the questionnaire and their respective uh, responses with frequencies and uh, percentages. So coming to the factors associated with the, uh, the practice of sunlight exposure, uh, on the binary logistic regression analysis, uh, the educational status of the mother, address, uh, whether she had a regular ANC follow-up or not, the place of delivery, uh, level of knowledge and attitude towards uh, sunlight exposure were uh, significantly associated with the practice of the infant sunlight exposure, taking the p-value to be uh, below uh, 0 0.25. So using the multivariate uh, logistic re uh, regression analysis, uh, the place of delivery, level of knowledge about uh, sunlight exposure, and level of attitude towards infant sunlight exposure were significantly associated with the level of uh, uh, infant sunlight exposure, uh, level of practice of in infant sunlight exposure, taking the p-value to be below uh, 0 0.05. So according to this analysis, uh, those mothers with uh, who delivered uh, in a health facility were 6.27 times more likely to have uh, good uh, sunlight exposure practice than those who delivered at home. And uh, those mothers with a good knowledge uh, of uh, with good knowledge about uh, infant sunlight exposure were 3.47 times more likely to have a good. Uh, uh, practice of sunlight exposure as compared to those with poor knowledge. Uh, those mothers with good attitude were also 2.34 times more likely to have good practice of sunlight exposure as compared to those with uh, poor attitude. So in the discussion part, the prevalence of good practice on this research was 47.4%, uh, which is much less than the number that was recorded in Debra Brahan, but uh, a larger number than uh, so once recorded in uh, Southern Nations, Dajan District, and uh, Yergalem, uh, when compared to the uh, with a study done uh, three years back in uh, Saint Paul's Hospital, the result shows that there is a significant decrement in the level of both uh, knowledge and uh, practice, and the level of attitude seems to have increased a bit from the previous years. So the results uh, found in this study were also different from the ones that were done in Addis Ababa in the year 2022, uh, in the fact that neonatal age family members living condition, uh, complete uh, antenatal care follow-up, delivery at term, and uh, poor uh, knowledge of sunlight exposure uh, and uh, no fear of 
sunlight exposure were factors that were associated with uh, neonatal sunlight exposure uh, practices in the previous research. So the discrepancies between these researches can be attributed to the differences between the operational definitions of the good practice uh, attitude and knowledge that were described in each uh, study, which were different. There is also a the time uh, difference also could be uh, attributed to this uh, to the time difference. So coming to the strengths of this study, the topic, uh, this is a topic of a great significance. So the impact it has on the mortality and morbidity of the children in the community is uh, not a uh, very significant, very important. So the other is it's a cross-sectional study design that uh, can be conducted in a short period of time with a limited source, uh, limited resource, which uh, fits the current economic status of the country and also the status of the conductor, which is me, the study conductor, uh, at the time of the study. So <clears throat> the data was collected by trained medical students and medical students have uh, better knowledge on data collection and they were given a training on how to minimize bias during data collection. And they are also better equipped with uh, to translate and better clarify the questions uh, of the questionnaire to the participants. And uh, the limitations, uh, associated risk factors of the variables like the knowledge uh, and at, uh, attitude uh, towards infant sunlight exposure amongst women were not studied. And the data collection tool used for this study was not standardized. And uh, the other is the generalizability of uh, the results to the community may be in question since the study was just conducted in a single uh, institution. So as a conclusion, a significant amount of participants exposed their infants to sunlight, uh, but only about 47.4% had uh, adequately exposed their infants to sunlight, which is a very low number given the significance of the topic itself. 49.1% uh, had good attitude and 41.5% had good knowledge of sunlight exposure uh, of infants. The place of delivery, the level of knowledge about uh, sunlight exposure, and the level of attitude towards infant sunlight exposure were significantly associated with the level of uh, practice of infant sunlight exposure. So as a recommendation, I recommend that uh, further studies on uh, associated risk factors uh, to associate the risk factors of uh, variables like knowledge and uh, attitude towards infant sunlight exposure amongst women uh, to be done, since they are significant and gives us a certain sense of direction on how to tackle the problem. And the other is a similar study to be conducted in the community level uh, to increase its generalizability uh, of the results. So health education also should be given, given the fact that uh, low, poor knowledge uh, makes a woman a mother vulnerable to uh, have a poor practice of sunlight exposure. Health education should be provided at every contact or at every hospital or health center visit of the mothers or the caregivers. So these are the references uh, I used. And thank you for listening. I will be here for further comments and uh, suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zion. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, honestly, whatever comment that we are going to give you, it doesn't matter because for an intern, you did a great job. Honestly, if someone gives me this paper and uh, I review it, I, I, from my experience so far, this is the quality of a paper uh, that I expect from a master's program, the way you designed the study, the way you handled your variables and the way you analyzed it, it's very mature and not something that I would expect from an intern where there is very little help in the program uh, to, 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 to support you write a quality paper and become independent researchers. So you did a great job. I am personally extremely happy. So just to make it further perfect and uh for you to publish your work 
you you can definitely use uh, comments from the reviewers and the audience. So we'll proceed to that. So let's start with Dr. Ab Abate. Dr. Abate, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fugis. Um, first, I actually like to thank you for uh, my invitation. And uh, it's really a privilege for me to be part of this important uh, discussion. Um, before I proceed to the uh, comments, uh, Dr. Sion, I'd I like to say that uh, you actually have done uh, an excellent job. This is not like Dr. Tigas uh, commented. This is not a paper I would uh, uh, expect from an uh, internship paper, but you have done it really uh, well. Uh, as to the comments that I am going to give, uh, it, th these comments are not mandatory to include or to change your paper, but uh, you can, I think, further uh, improve the paper even if it is well done. But still, you can uh, further improve your paper, the quality and clarity, if you take some of the comments, but it doesn't mean that you have to take comments. So, um, the title was good, and the, the thesis that I reviewed actually it says knowledge, attitude, and drive, but now it is shortened to be uh, practice, and that is the way I would like to, uh, I would like the title to be. So th it, this is good. And generally, uh, you may need some language in it, and uh, as this is already uh, a thesis, you can you can change. Uh, the, the, the future tense into a past tense, that is how we write thesis, like proposals, so this can be changed. And one of is uh, you can, uh, you, you should actually be consistent throughout your paper, uh, like the, the, the title, uh, the, the abstract, the introduction, methods, results, uh, discussion, and finally the, the concluding remark. All of this be actually consistent. Should be talking the same thing. There are some um, uh, differences in the different parts, so you can go through this uh, again, and you can uh, you you have to make sure that your paper is consistent throughout uh, the whole. And my other comment generally is, um, it would be nice if you have uh, this framework, conceptual framework. Uh, so that you can organize uh, the, the especially the switch factors can be well organized and well addressed. And one one other comment, general comment for everybody who actually participate in this uh, MRL is it, it would have been much better if we have uh, the proposal the proposal reviewed here and we actually do the, the study based on the comments from the uh, different. Uh, expert is that uh, took part here. And then finally, again, we can also discuss the, the result here uh, so that the study actually can be uh, much benefited uh, from from uh, the start of the proposal. But for now, this is uh, not possible for the student. But in the future, I think it will be best if the, the proposals are also discussed here. I think it is open for both proposals and in, in the thesis. Uh, here. So that is an opportunity just I would like to uh, emphasize or uh, point out. And coming to the uh, details, uh, I'd like to see uh, starting from the introduction. The introduction is important so that we will go through uh, the existing literature and then uh, try to justify our research. And also we, we, we gather information uh, on the previous knowledge in the uh, subject area, and we want to understand the, the previous studies, and we want to see the, the gap in, in the knowledge, in the practice, and attitude. For example, here uh, in your study, uh, we are interested in the, in the, the practice of uh, mothers uh, of infants. Uh, so here, we, we should actually focus in the introduction specific to our topic. For example, you, you don't have to go to development of infants about the details or basic thing about vitamin D rather. You can focus on 
the, the practice of uh, sun ex satellite exposure in infants, and you you try to see uh, what 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 related uh, scientific knowledge is uh, related to your your uh, study. Uh, what 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 is known already in this area? What is the gap? How were the previous studies done? What is the gap in those studies? How can I improve? In, in the maybe in the methodology, or maybe in the in the in the the way it is conducted. So we have to interpret all the previous results uh, and go into the details of these studies. Uh, and once we go through this. What is important would be to make sure that there is something in fraud from, from our study. So that uh, actually it will not be just a duplication of uh, the same information that someone has already done. So with this respect, actually, uh, you know, in Ethiopia, there are some, some areas, actually many areas where there is no data at all. With that respect, actually, a handful of studies in this area previously. So, when you justify your study here, I would I would not uh, primarily focus on the scarcity of data. Rather, what was the limitation of the previous studies? What was recommended from previous studies, so that I can go into that limitation and try to improve the quality of data in this area, rather than uh, replicating uh, the same result in, in in the same area. So I I would I would I would focus. Uh, here uh, to to for, to improve uh, the limitations of the previous studies. Otherwise, you have the same study in Addis or in the regions uh, here in Ethiopia, and we do the same study. Uh, what we we come up with uh, finally will be uh, the same recommendation as uh, the previous studies, and it will be a duplication. And uh, as a result, a detailed literature review. I summarized that and, and, and uh, looking into the details of the methodology and their findings and re re reviewing this critically will, will actually help you uh, to, to uh, uh, come up with a new and a better uh, justified and, and a, a, a research with a new finding with, with a more strong uh, evidence compared to the previous studies. So when you justify, when you come up with, when you put your statement uh, of the problem, in general, when you go through the literature review, uh, you, you should critically uh, appraise the previous uh, studies, including uh, actually in this area, uh, there are also uh, meta-analysis or uh, literature review as well uh, that, that's recently published. So that can be a, a very important resource to, to start with as a baseline. So once you summarize uh, the literature review, uh, you should come up with a, a, a critical uh, question that help you see the limitation of the previous studies so that your study now could be uh, a more strong one. And in the, in the objective, uh, there the, the is uh, more focus on the practice and then the knowledge in the associated uh, factors, uh, the knowledge and the attitude are actually taken as associated factors, which I actually uh, agree with, with, with. And in the setting, when you describe the setting, I think you, you could a little bit discuss about the pediatric or pedi intent pulse. I mean, if infants or patients are seen, uh, how is the patient population uh, there, uh, and, and how is the practice in the rights? You don't have to uh, discuss the, the broad St. Paul's community, rather, the pediatrics of PD will be your setting uh, or your area of interest. And uh, in the methodology part, I think Dr. Tibis will be focusing on that. Uh, I don't have to go into the details there. But a little bit about your uh, uh, sampling method. It was not detailed enough, so I suggest you a little bit go into details. How was the sampling? Why, why did you uh, actually go to uh, random sampling, why not maybe systematic random sampling would have been better. So, uh, and, and actually you have to tell us how was, the, for example, the, how was the first patient actually, the first uh, subject, how was it 
selected and how is it uh, uh, sampled uh, subsequently. And uh, in the variables, uh, there are some variables like the year of the study, religion, monthly income, relation. What would be the relevance of these things in the knowledge and attitude and, and practice of sun exposure? So I would expect some scientific explanations for those variables. Uh, directly or indirectly affecting the knowledge and practice of mothers uh, of infants. So, if the year of the the, the year of study, uh, had it been the season of the year, maybe related to sun exposure, that might be important to, to the practice. For example, the rainy season where there is no uh, enough sun, parents might not be exposing them. They may not be able to expose their their infants. Uh, Optimally, that could affect uh, your uh, satellite exposure uh, rate. But generally, the year of study, whether it is 2022 or 2023, I would not expect to affect your your uh, practice of uh, sun exposure. So there are some variables that I'm not clear really why they are included here. So I, I suggest you go through them again and, and uh, uh, revise. And Others like vaccination history, rather than vaccination history, um, whether the parents or the mothers received uh, instruction on satellite exposure during uh, the vaccine visits might be an important uh, variable rather than the presence of vaccination or not. Or uh, I'm not sure if you are trying to elicit this indirect uh, possibility. Uh, it will be good to to make sure that your your uh, variables are clear for your readers as well as for uh, yourself. And in the questionnaire, I'm not sure whether the questionnaire you used was uh, adopted from previous questionnaires so with validated questionnaires with uh, you know psychometric scores or a new one that you developed. Uh, if you developed uh, a new questionnaire, it's important to. Uh, tests uh, on on patients uh, and and also report some of the psychometric scores. Um, th th this is something that you can do in the future. Actually, not not a very important one, but it just just uh, will be nice if you tell us whether this was uh, newly developed or uh, adopted from previous uh, questions. And ethical considerations. One important point that uh, I I didn't get is. I, you didn't mention whether you have taken consent from your participants. Well, it is not an invasive study. There is no intervention, but still you have to get consent, whatever study uh, type of, of uh, design uh, this is. So it's very important to mention that you have requested consent, based written, at least uh, verbal, and you, you, you take data or information after you uh, get consent from your participant. This is very important. Um, and uh, in, the, in the presentation of the results, um, for just two options, like for example, knowledge, good or poor, you have uh, provided us with high charts or uh, figures in the likes. I think for one or two variables, you don't have to add uh, this in your uh, result presentation. Um, for a lot of data with multiple variables, it will be nice to have figures, tables, and the likes. But if you have just one thing to tell, just you can just uh, report it. And you don't have to construct a table or a pie or something like that. And in, in your uh, result, um, you have uh, some 30 or 30, 32 individuals who actually never exposed their children to um, satellite. So I would expect uh, a follow-up question here. Uh, what was the reason for that? For example, it might not be the lack of knowledge here. Um, maybe they are actually practicing, you know, American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation actually is to avoid satellite exposure and completely uh, depend on uh, vitamin D supplement. So. What if some of them are actually following this? Is, is it possible? So was there a follow-up question here, uh, evaluating uh, those uh, 30-something mothers? Uh, why was they not exposing their, their children? Are they using vitamin D drop? 
some of them actually also may have um, problems with uh, their living area. For example, living in at least in condominium areas in uh, apartments actually may make uh, sunlight exposure difficult. So they might have to opt to vitamin D uh, supplementation. It, it, this is probably uh, an important reason for people living in Addis. So have you evaluated that and actually uh, could that be some of the reasons for not exposing the children that they have an adequate knowledge? Um, proceeding to uh, the, the, the discussion, uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, interested to uh, see actually uh, the, the interpretation of your results. What, what does it mean? You have this result. Okay. So what does it mean? How should we interpret this? Uh, what is the meaning of your study, your result, uh, in the context of previous uh, similar results or different results? So rather than just simply comparing the results, we should actually try to show the implication of our, our study. And when we interpret these, it's, 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 it's important. Uh, for example, your uh, research showed that, uh, that the practice is nearly uh, half of the mothers who have good practice. Uh, and in um, previous studies, somewhere 44%, 45% from other uh, sites in Ethiopia, um, they, they reported good practice in 44, 45%. You have 47% almost. Uh, so th these are similar results. You reported the 44 and 45% as lower than my result. No, th 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 they are almost similar. You, you, should, you should not uh, report them lower than or higher than. If you have 45 and 44, 47%, it is it's almost the same. To, 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 to compare results, you, you don't take uh, the absolute percent or uh, a little difference should not be taken as significant. To, to do that, you, you have to have uh, a lot, a lot, a lot uh, higher uh, number of patients, and the significance actually should be huge, like maybe 80% and 30% or 40%. That is significant. But 47 and 45 should be actually reported as similar, not, not, not as uh, different. So the interpretation needs. Uh, to take considerations of the study design, the number of uh, patients or your sample size, you, you have relatively small sample size. So you should be cautious when you actually interpret your result and you should focus on the meaning of your result rather than uh, simple comparison uh, from previous studies. And, and, and finally, you have actually included in the presentation, that is good, but uh, in the manuscript, uh, I mean, the, in the thesis, there was no limitation uh, of your study. In your strings, by the way, in the part that you mentioned as a string, uh, my personal uh, feeling is that those actually should be considered as a standard, or th these are requirements. You have to have the, the required knowledge. You have that, I agree, but that is not the string. It's a requirement. So the string should be something beyond that. So I think you, can, you should uh, revise your strings. The limitations also, uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, some acceptable limitations. Uh, and in, in the conclusion, uh, you have uh, modified in your presentation, that's good. The conclusion should focus on the objective. Your, your objective is to evaluate the practice or to determine the level of practice, and you should put that in, in your conclusion, and then Illustrates factors. You have mentioned that there are three variables uh, that are or, or three factors that are associated with good practice. Uh, so you, you have actually well uh, outlined this uh, in the conclusion. Uh, the recommendation also should uh, sh it should be derived from your result. Uh, you you have uh, recommended um, to 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 further studies. That, 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 that is actually a very good, a very good recommendation. The base we could do, or you could recommend from uh, from such uh, cross-sectional studies, actually is uh, further studies with a more uh, strong evidence from a, be a better design. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, 
related to health education because your study didn't show that health education is a problem. What you could probably say is to improve the knowledge and attitude uh, to work uh, on this, uh, to, to, on, on uh, mechanisms to improve the knowledge and attitude. We are not sure whether health education would improve the knowledge or the attitude. Uh, it, you cannot take this directly. Uh, what you could actually say is, if we could improve the knowledge, and if we could improve the attitude, uh, and if, if we could improve uh, the institution delivery, then we probably could improve the practice. Actually, the health education, is it going to improve the practice uh, or the knowledge or, or uh, the, the attitude? That this indirect inference is a little bit uh, difficult. And finally, uh, in, in your reference, I've noticed there are some references which are not uh, included uh, in the introduction or in the literature review, uh, not in the discussion, but still they are included in the uh, thesis. I assume they were in the, in the uh, proposal, but now not in the uh, thesis. So either you have to include some uh, in the discussion or in the, in, the, in, the, in the introduction or somewhere in the literature review, or you have to remove them. All the reference should be uh, already used somewhere in, in, in your uh, study. And uh, the reference uh, citation, you should probably use one of the format, for example, maybe Vancouver style or uh, other standardized format uh, based on the requirement from your college, uh, like St. Paul's, or maybe uh, based on the recommendation from the journal that you are planning to submit. Uh, so these are my uh, few comments. Uh, but I, again, uh, I like to conclude with uh, the impression that you have done a great job. Thank you very much. Over Thank, to you. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Rabata. Uh, you have given her a very thorough comment. So I'm going to add a uh, few things that you haven't addressed. Uh, so uh, as for the justification, since it's a very important part, uh, you should really have a very good rationale for conducting the studies. I know um, you've mentioned that there is a steel gap in the practice uh, as, ev as evidenced by different studies conducted in Ethiopia, outside Ethiopia. And I know uh, for a fact that there are many other students who are working on a similar topic currently and have completed a similar uh, article and in the process of publication and uh, uh, the thing that they all share is that they don't uh, purely show the limitations that they have observed from the other comparable research. Rather, they just keep saying that there is a problem, the practice is still low. So if you witness that the practice is low, as evidenced by different studies, then uh, the, the, it calls for a research from a different perspective, maybe a qualitative research uh, to understand better why uh, the mothers are not uh, practicing uh, the expected or recommended sunlight exposure technique. So instead of just doing uh, the same research again and proving that the problem is huge, doesn't solve the problem. Rather, we should address it from a different direction. So, so if you are con planning to publish this article, then you have to strongly work on uh, the justification part and try to show that it's actually uh, a relevant re research. Otherwise. Um, however well designed it is. And uh, even if you do your statistical analysis perfectly, it doesn't matter because as long as it doesn't add anything to the existing literature, uh, journals will not be interested in the article. So please work on that. Uh, the other is on the source and study population. Uh, every time uh, in any research, uh, whenever you state your source and study uh, population, uh, they should be stated with uh, a time frame. Uh, without putting a time frame, it's difficult to call it a source population because a source population is a population which which serves as a framework or uh, um, for our study population. Uh, so sometimes even uh, we're expected to have uh, the MRN or uh, the, uh, the medical record number or some other identification of the source population so that we can use it as a sampling frame to recruit our study participants. So to ask for that source population identification number, you have to have a time boundary. So you, as, as a cross-sectional study, you're expected to go to the pediatrics OPD and 
ask the nurses for the medical record number of uh, the 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 uh, children who are on follow up during the period from uh, February to March, so that uh, you can have you can use them as a, a source population uh, to recruit your study population from. So whenever you state your source and study population, make sure that it's time bound. What you have stated now. Uh, on the source population is not time bound. And the difference between source and study population is that they both are similar. Uh, the only difference is your study population includes those you have selected from the source population. And the selection criteria is based on the eligibility criteria. So all those selected participants to be included in the study from the source population based on the state eligibility criteria are your study population and both source and study population should be specified with a time range, a time boundary. As for the sample size determination, I think we've addressed this in the previous um, webinars as well. So for a cross-sectional study design, uh, you have two specific objectives, right? The first one is what we call the descriptive objective is to estimate the prevalence of good sunlight exposure practice. And the second objective, which is the inferential objective is to identify factors that affect good uh, practice of sunlight exposure among the mothers. So for the descriptive objective, what we're doing is we're estimating the prevalence. Uh, so to estimate the prevalence, uh, the proper thing to do is uh, to calculate sample size using single population proportion formula. So this formula doesn't have any power, doesn't consider power. You don't see beta values, you only see alpha values. So uh, from this formula, what we can get is the, the, the proper sample size that's required to answer our uh, descriptive objective, which is estimating the prevalence of uh, good practice. But for the inferential objective, which is to identify factors associated with good practice, you need a formula with the power. Because whenever we talk about association, we're testing a hypothesis. And to test a hypothesis uh, and to uh, to get your answer, you should, uh, you should have adequate power. Otherwise, you won't be able to pick the presence of a good relationship, uh, a significant relationship between your exposure and outcome. So to do that uh, in a cross-sectional study design, for the inferential objective, you have to calculate a different sample size than the first one uh, using a formula called double population proportion formula. So we're saying proportion in both single and double because her outcome is categorical variable. If her outcome was like uh, a, a, a mm -hmm. continuous variable, like something that we measure on a linear scale, then the mm -hmm. proper mm -hmm. formula to use will be a single uh, population mean uh, formula and double population mean formulas. But in this case, since she has divided her uh, outcome variable, which is practice, into good and poor. The proper formula to use is a formula that uh, addresses proportion. So the single population proportion formula will be used for uh, estimating the prevalence for the descriptive objective. And the double population proportion formula will be used to uh, estimate the sample size for the inferential objective, which is to identify associated factors. So the double population formula calculation is completely missing, and you have to I know I don't know. At least uh, try to calculate it now and see if it actually suffices uh, the uh, requirements uh, based on the one that you have used. And as for the correction formula, we have also ad addressed this in previous webinars. Uh, the place of uh, using uh, finite population correction formula uh, is somehow debatable. If your sample size, the overall sample size is large, and if you you actually believe that correcting it will uh, decrease the sample size in a reasonable way and decrease the resource that's required to conduct the study and will put less participants into, you know, at least this cumbersome process, even if it's not, uh, it doesn't have any risk associated with it because of the nature of the study. Um, we have to make sure that after the correction, the sample size is still good enough uh, to answer our research question. So you have finally ended up with 171 participants, but if you did not correct it, you, uh, I don't know, it will be something like 200 uh, something above. So with whenever the sample size gets lower, uh, your study becomes less powered and uh, you might not even be able to conduct uh, regression analysis because of small frequency issues. So unless it's uh, a very high risk study, and uh, the associated uh, cost is high, it's better to refrain 
uh, from using finite population correction in situations where that is going to lead to a very small sample size, like something like less than 200, uh, and uh, finally ending up, ending up with a result which doesn't make sense. So uh, when we come to the variables, uh, in addition to uh, what Dr. Abate mentioned, uh, like the vitamin D supplementation, the living uh, status of the mothers, which might prevent them from uh, practicing uh, the sunlight exposure, we should also consider the season of the year, right? Uh, so without considering that, if we ask a mother, uh, if she's practicing well for a child who's born, I don't know, in uh, June, July, then it doesn't make sense because even if she wants to practice, she won't be able to practice because of the season of the year. Multiple other environmental and other uh, uh, factors should be considered uh, in addition to the ones that are asked. Uh, well, it's too late. We can't add that now, but we can write it as a limitation of the study so that other researchers can address it in the future. For the operational definition, let me go back to the audience and what do you understand by operational definition? What does it mean? Let me give you 30 seconds and drop your answers. Uh, so while you're dropping your answers, um, whenever we talk about operational definition, we're talking about variables. Thank you. Clear and precise description of how a variable is measured. Great, Hewan. This is very uh, nice and uh, correct answer. So when we talk about operational definition, we're talking about variables which are not measured, like uh, using a straightforward measurement uh, scales or variables that are that can be measured from using different tools so that uh, we want to specify which tool we're going to use and how we're going to measure our variable. So when we have variables like this, like knowledge, attitude, practice, uh, perception, and other variables that need to be measured from uh, based on a composite score of different uh, questions, then we have to be careful. So one uh, very important characteristics of an operational definition is that any variable that we use in our study should be standardized, it should have a standardized measurement. So what you have to specify on operational definition is how many questions that you are going to ask to, to get an answer to that question. For example, she wants to measure practice. So how many questions is she going to ask? And are those questions standardized questions or questions that she, has, she just developed and are not validated? And the other is the scoring system associated with it. Sometimes, uh, you can have 10 questions and the weight that you give for the different questions might not be the same because of the difference in their uh in their in the implications they have in in terms of the patient, the individual's attitude or practice or knowledge so the scoring system should also be standardized and should be specified and finally we usually have a tendency to classify our variables into good poor adequate inadequate so if we are going to do that the cutoff point should also be based on some standard source. We just can't uh, decide on using a cutoff point of 50% or 80% or 90% just because we want to use it like that or uh, just because some uh, previous research used that. So previous research cannot be a reference, cannot be used as a standard reference. Rather, a standard reference is a reference uh, that is generated uh, by some uh, like bodies like WHO, WHO, CDC, or some federal government. Uh, why we are using these references is that because these institutions develop uh, standards based on research conducted in different uh, institutions, in different society at different time, so that they have come up with a more uh, agreeable tools that can be used in different setups. So other than that, unless uh, you get a research that is uh, a research to validate the tool that you are going to use. You can't simply use ref uh, um, variable measurement tools from other studies that do not 
uh, that are not validated. So what I see here is that, uh, Dr. Zion, you, you, you did not put any reference for your uh, operational definitions and the cutoff points that you, that you have used are not justifiable. So I think it's very important to revisit that because you, you can do the, you can reanalyze uh, the variables, you can do the, redo the scoring and everything because you already have the data. All you need is just uh, make it more acceptable in terms of uh, operationalizing it. So whenever we talk about operational definition, the number of questions, the scoring system, the cutoff point, all of these things have to be standard. And um, with regard to the regression analysis method that you have used, you mentioned that you have used uh, multivariable logistic regression. And at some point uh, you wrote that you have used multinomial logistic regression. Uh, which one is right for the audience, not for its own? So these are the things that I have uh, come across while reading the thesis report. So multivariable logistic regression, multinomial logistic regression, binary logistic regression. Which model uh, do you think she used because she has already presented the regression results? You can put it on the table, on the regression table. Which one did she use? From the audience? Thank you, Tashoma, binary logistic regression. Do you agree, the rest of you? So there are, thank you, Tashoma, there are three different types of logistic regression analysis methods. The first one is, thank you, Ashalo, binary. Um, Yes, thank you. So binary logistic regression. The other is multinomial. And the third one is ordinal. So binary logistic regression is, uh, okay. Okay, so binary logistic regression is a type of regression, logistic regression analysis that we use when our outcome is a uh, categorical variable with binary outcomes. So she, she divided uh, the practice into two groups, good and poor. So this is binary outcome. So for a binary out categorical outcome with a cross-sectional study design, you have to use binary logistic regression. If she had two or more groups like uh, adequate, inadequate, or some low, medium, high practice, something like that, three or more groups. And if they don't have any natural order, we use a multinomial logistic regression. And if these three or more groups, if they have a natural order, uh, we use an ordinal logistic regression. So uh, you have to be consistent when you state what kind of regression analysis method that you have used uh, throughout the document, uh, starting from the abstract. So please review it that way. Uh, on the ethical consideration, since this is a serious thing, I want to repeat it. You did not put uh, if whether you have obtained informed consent or not. Uh, so please incorporate that into your presentation. The other is when we come to the result part, a very interesting finding is that this is her outcome. So I, I want everyone to see this and tell me if you are okay with um, the finding. So this is these are uh, the proportions of good practice, attitude and knowledge she has obtained. So does it make sense? Is it logical? Is it logical? Are you comfortable with this finding? The knowledge score is lower than the good attitude score. And then the practice score is lower than the attitude score. So for someone to have a good attitude about something, they should have the knowledge first, right? So if you think about it logically, the knowledge, the good knowledge score should be higher than the attitude score because uh, for someone to have a good attitude, they should have the knowledge about the, the topic we're talking about. So if they have good knowledge about the topic, we expect them to have good attitude, but everyone with good knowledge is not expected to have a good attitude, right? Someone might know about the practice of, uh, the good practice of sunlight exposure, how it should be done and everything, but they might believe uh, in a different way that it's not 
good and they might not practice it. So we normally expect that the good knowledge score is higher and uh, the good attitude score is something lower than that. And even among those with good attitude, how many practice that? Uh, again, the percent is expected to drop because a lot of people with good attitude, for example, when you when you when you when we talk about blood donation, uh, people know that donating blood is good. But from let's say the same people who believe that who actually know that donating blood is good and doesn't have a serious health uh, consequence, uh, eight might be interested in uh, might have a good attitude towards donating. And from the eight, I don't know five or six actually practice it. So the number that we get usually has to be within the, the sequence if the data that we collect is uh, actually, I don't know, correct. So it's better to revisit it, but there are also other issues associated with the questions that she has asked. So um, on the sunlight, on the attitude exposure part, thank you, Victor. Better knowledge leads to having good attitude uh, towards some, yeah. And then good attitude will lead to uh, good practice, right? So the percentage decreases from good uh, from knowledge to attitude and then to practice. So for the attitude questions, she asked the following questions. And I, I really want you um, to take a look at this and decide for yourself if these questions are actually questions that can be used to assess attitude. So actually the questions are very few, that's one issue. It's very difficult to assess attitude with just, you know, four questions. She has four questions. One is actually the opposite of the first one. Sunlight exposure of infants is advantageous is one question. And sunlight exposure of infants is disadvantageous is another question. They both address the same thing. And one is the reverse of the other. I don't believe they should be asked uh, twice in one questioner. You can either go for the advantages or disadvantages. And you should drop that. So that will leave you with three questions. So do you believe the second and the third questions are appropriate questions to assess attitude? It says, what do you think is the benefit of sunlight exposure of infants? And the third is, what are the disadvantages of sunlight exposure? Are these attitude questions or knowledge questions? These are knowledge questions, right? Yeah, these are knowledge questions. So we have to be careful. This is the problem associated with using uh, other research uh, questions as it is. You have to assess and judge for yourself if it is at least uh, a question that makes sense to be asked uh, in order to assess uh, the participant's attitude, knowledge, or practice. So I think, Dr. Tsihon, you have to really go through this thing and uh, reclassify the questions into attitude, knowledge, and practice, because most of them are knowledge questions, what you have here. and. There are very few questions to, to actually uh, assess someone's attitude. And the knowledge question is also very shallow. I think there's a lot that you can add if you dig in the subject matter. But since this is already a thesis report, it's better to go through all the knowledge, attitude, and practice questions and reclassify them and make sure that all of the questions are into the right place, uh, the right category, so that they make uh, sense. The other is... Um, the interpretation for uh, your regression analysis looks more like a relative risk interpretation. You know, it's very important to interpret our results properly because relative risk and odds ratio, they tell us completely different things. And uh, it's important to make sure that your interpretation reflects the measure of association that you have calculated. But another very interesting question, um, finding that she has is uh, again, with regard to the knowledge attitude, uh, practice um, flow of result that we expect. Both knowledge and attitude are significant variables in her study. So what does this mean? Uh, you can check the chat box. So knowledge is significant and attitude is significant. So uh, knowledge is significant by 3.47 times and attitude by 2.34 times. So how do you see this result? So mothers with good knowledge have a good practice by like 3.47 times. And mothers with good attitude, they have 
a good practice by 2.34 times. So in the state of the attitude, the knowledge is better in, in practicing uh, good sunlight exposure. Is that logical? I mean, isn't it, shouldn't it be the attitude that leads to a good practice than the knowledge? So the score that she gets is a bit confusing and it needs, um, I don't know, when you do that, when you redo the analysis, I think you might uh, come up with a more sensible result. And your regression table, I see these types of tables here and there when I review articles as well. Uh, in your uh, presentation of the regression table, you should uh, you should include every uh, significant variable that you have found from the univariate analysis. You shouldn't present only those which are significant from the multivariable analysis. Uh, it's very important to see what variables were controlled and what was how was the data distribution and what was the results? Uh, it's good to have the whole picture of the regression analysis, the multivariable regression analysis that you have run. So please present the entire result. And on the discussion part, please uh, the first slide of the discussion. Dr. Abata also mentioned it. Uh, just to add on something, in research. Uh, what we are more interested in is not the absolute value. Just like any physiologic parameters, laboratory parameters, every result should be presented within a range of values. And that range of values can be a standard deviation, interquartile range, 95% confidence interval, depending on what we are running, uh, what kind of statistical analysis that we're running. So here, whenever you want to compare uh, the prevalence or incidence of your result with other research, what you what you have to do is you have to compare the result with the 95% confidence interval of the result from the other research. So as uh, Dr. Abata said, 44 and 45% and 47.4% might not be that different. If you go and check the 95% confidence interval of the other research, I'm sure you'll find 47.4% within the other two, within the researches that are conducted at uh, Dejan district and Yirgalem. And if they don't report the 95% confidence interval, what you can do is calculate 95% confidence interval for your prevalence, and you will definitely find 44 and 45% within the range of 95% confidence interval of your result. So whenever we compare results of uh, estimates, prevalence, incidence, mean, or uh, median, we have to look within the range of values, not only just the absolute value. So definitely these results are not different from the results that uh, you have uh, obtained. And most of, actually, all of your discussion uh, really relied on comparing your results with other studies. But what you're expected to do is explain what the result means, contextualize it, in terms of the scientific background, the study population characteristics, and uh, any logic that we know so far. So instead of that, you just compare the results with other results, the, the, the results with other studies, and that's the last thing that you should do. And uh, as for the justification of the difference that you have obtained with other research, what you have put is that uh, it's because you might have used different operational definitions. That's what I exactly said on the operational definition part. Operational definition is a definition that should be similar across studies and across different places. So if you have used a proper standard uh, definition or operational definition, this shouldn't be an issue. And if the other studies have also used a standard definition, this shouldn't be an issue. So using different operational definition is not acceptable because to call it an operational definition, it should be standardized and uniform across studies. So please revisit that uh, at least to the best of your ability at this point. And um, as for the strength of the study, uh, you say that it's not well studied. It's actually very well studied. It's not still clear wh the, what is the justification of your study. Uh, and cr using cross-sectional study, seriously, it is not a strength. Um, you mentioned the economic constraint as a justification for using this type of study designs in a country like Ethiopia. All observational studies other than prospective cohort studies are equally um, 
equally are equal in terms of uh, the resource they need. You can design cross-sectional study or case control study or retrospective court with the same budget that you have. So this is not a good justification and using cross-sectional study design doesn't make it a strong study. It should be removed. And as for the limitation part, I honestly don't understand this, how the rest of you, I don't know, help me here on the limitation part. Please uh, put the slide on the limitation part. So it says that associated risk factors for the variables like knowledge and attitude towards infant light exposure among women who's not studied. I thought you studied these variables and these are actually uh, your uh, um, significant variables, right? Or are you talking about assessing the factors that affect their knowledge and attitude? If that's the case, you already have the data. There is no reason to put it as a limitation. You can run it. Besides, your interest is not finding what affects the knowledge and what affects the attitude. You started with uh, an objective of uh, studying what affects the practice of the participants. So I don't believe this is a limitation at all. If you believe it's a limitation, you can calculate it. You can run it. You can identify the associated factors because you have the data. Uh, and you say that the data collection tool used for this study was not standardized. So why, why do we want to listen to this research at all? I mean, you, you just disqualify the entire thing that you did. If, if you know that this is not a standardized tool and reflects as um, a limitation of your study, why didn't you take care of it at the beginning? When we talk about strength and limitation, we're not talking about things that we could have prevented, we could have controlled for. We're talking about things that were been beyond our control in terms of uh, different biases that might be introduced into the study due to the nature of the study design or the, nature, the way we collect the data or due to lack of, I don't know, resources or, uh, or some constraints. But this is something that you could have definitely prevented and it just makes your study look very weak and unjustifiable. So it's not a good thing to present it here. Uh, you should remove it. And the other is generalizability of the results. Again, what was your intention? You were not interested in generalizing the findings to the community. So you purposely conducted the study in an institution, hoping to uh, understand the practice of the mothers who are visiting a healthcare institution. In that case, I think studying, conducting a study uh, in a tertiary center might have its own advantage, but also its own disadvantage because of the peculiar characteristics of uh, the patients that we see in those types of institutions. So again, this is somehow not properly reflected. It should be reshaped. Uh, first, you should uh, clearly uh, decide on what was your interest when you conduct this study. If it is uh, to provide some community level generalization, uh, it, it cannot do that because of uh, the nature of the study that it was intentionally designed to be conducted in an institution. So if you're interested in institution-based study, what was the intention? Was it to generalize it to other similar setup population or uh, did you have a different intention? I mean, as a tertiary hospital, uh, were you expecting to see better practice because it's a higher level institution, there might be health education, there might be some other good follow-up and other things. What was the intention? You should put that and uh, convince the audience. And as for the conclusion, it's just a mere repetition of the result that you have obtained. Uh, instead, on the conclusion part, you are expected to show uh, what was the implication of the research. You just repeated the numbers again. We don't want to see numbers rather. What does it mean? What does it imply? And and your recommendation, uh, yeah, your recommendation. Again, uh, recommendation part. And Dr. Zion on the recommendation part. Next slide. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah. Further studies on associated risk factors. Yeah, that is something that you can do as uh, I said earlier. You can you can analyze that and give the answer yourself. We don't need any other study. And uh, when you recommend uh, 
a different study to be conducted in the future. You have to be very specific in addition to community level study. Uh, how should it be designed? How should it be conducted? Uh, should it be specified so that other researchers can actually uh, conduct that uh, study if they're interested. And health education, I, it can be actually, uh, we can actually see it from the perspective of uh, knowledge poor knowledge leads to poor practice so with good education then we might increase the knowledge of the population and with good knowledge comes good attitude and uh, finally good practice so i think we can keep that as it is but the rest uh, i think what you should do is go through the questions that you have asked for knowledge attitude practice reclassify them into uh, the categories because you have uh, four questions on attitude and two of them are uh, knowledge questions and some of uh, the practice and knowledge questions are also mixed. So figure that out first and redo the scoring and uh, cutoff points and other things. And after that, rerun the regression analysis. I'm sure by then you'll get a result that makes more sense than the one that we ha you have obtained now, which shows that some of the things are contradictory. So these are some of my questions and uh, Dr. Abate, and I will share you uh, the comments that we have made on a track change on the main document. Uh, you can go through it on your own time. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'll go to the audience. Uh, I'll give a chance for the audience to ask questions, especially those of you who are working on a similar research. It, will be a good opportunity to reflect your ideas, suggest something. Anybody? Uh, the other minor things are uh, to some, okay, uh, to some of you, drop your questions. The choice of uh, words, uh, you said illiterate. Illiterate is it's an obsolete term. We no longer use it, uh, replace it with cannot read and write. And for the classification of knowledge, attitude, and uh, practice, you used poor and good expression. Those are also not proper terminologies in the current era. Rather for practice, um, you know, um, adequate, inadequate practice and knowledge. And for attitude, it's better to use favorable and unfavorable attitude. So just replace them and do not use poor and good. Yeah, what's your major finding? So Dr. Zion, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll collect the questions and I'll, 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 I'll ask you those, but let me give you a few minutes. You're not expected to answer all the questions. Like we said, for an intern, you did a great job, honestly. And these are suggestions that you can consider when you revise your article uh, for publication. So would you like to reflect on the suggestions we provided? Let me give you the opportunity. Dr. Zion? I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for all the reflections. I wish I knew all of this when I started the study because uh, the reason I started this study is because I had uh, exposed with the patients during my internship and during even in C1 that had uh, poor knowledge of uh, sunlight exposure and so on. That was why I specifically chose this. And it was not just for the sake of the uh, uh, completion of the public health department requirements for the graduation. So I really wish I knew this, but the, some of the suggestions that were provided are actually mendable even at this stage of the study and I will try to do that and thank you uh, both Dr. Awata and uh, uh, Dr. Tegust for your suggestions. Just as a reflection, uh, I uh, used a random sampling technique because 
uh, the the uh, participants were not cho uh, chosen from the charts or from the HMIs. They were chosen from their visits on the day of their visits. Uh, they were not called upon for the data collection. That was why it was hard to make it a systematic uh, sampling uh, technique. That was why I chose it. If there are uh, other suggestions of sampling techniques, I am um, open to suggestions. And the uh, uh, social demographic factors like the socioeconomic status, the literacy, and so on. I believe they might have an influence on uh, the knowledge in, uh, indirectly in, uh, having an impact on the uh, practice. That was why I uh, included them in my questionnaire. And consent was taken in the ethical consideration part, uh, but I failed to mention it on my uh, presentation, which is which should have been mentioned. And the remaining uh, suggestions, I am very happy to uh, know this now, even at this stage, and I will name them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zion. Matthias asked a very interesting question. Is an interview a good way to measure the practice of sunlight exposure? What, what do you say? maybe um, for any practice assessment, the best way is observation, right? Matthias, I think that's what you're trying to say. So uh, to assess the practice of anything, the most appropriate thing to do is just do a direct observation because people might say that uh, they practice uh, uh, to the expected level if you give them a paper and ask them if they're practicing it. But when you actually try to observe that, most people fail to do the required uh, steps or standards, fail to follow the required standards. But that would require a community-based study. And even with direct observation, there's uh, associated risk of bias, what we call uh, um, oh God, help me here. When someone is observing you, you tend to change your behavior into a desirable behavior, right? So um, yeah. there's a bad association. What? Yeah. The thorn effect. Social desirability. Yeah. How to effect yeah. or social desirability bias. Thank you. Thank you, Dretti. So social desirability bias is uh, a problem associated with direct observation. Otherwise, you can't observe people without telling them that they're being observed because of the ethical issues associated with it. When you tell them that you're observing them, they will change their behavior, right? There is a, uh, there is a problem whichever way you, you think about it. And most importantly, for her study, since she's conducting an institution-based study, she can do a direct observation uh, because that's something that you, you can do within a community. Uh, Sadiq is, well, has, I think let's take that as a, as a suggestion. He's saying that uh, definitely uh, people know about sunlight exposure. I don't believe it's a problem of knowledge. It's a good point. That's what we have been saying. There are so many studies within Ethiopia, within Addis Ababa, within even in at St. Paul Hospital three years back. So instead of just trying to repeat similar studies and prove that the problem is there, it's better to approach it from a different direction, from a different angle and learn about why the problem happened. Probably a qualitative research is a much better answer at this point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hermes. Can we use Pearson correlation coefficient to analyze the relationship between the data variables? This is a very good question. The Ripsa, um, oh, he always leaves before we finish the session. So uh, wh why when do we use Pearson correlation for the audience? When do we use Pearson correlation? Or for Hermes, uh, when do we use Pearson correlation? And for which variables do you suggest to use Pearson correlation uh, for Dr. Zion's research? Uh, Dr. Hermes, um, you can unmute your mic and you can explain or you can write it down. So Pearson correlation is, thank you. Uh, 
yeah percent yeah 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 no, percent correlation is uh a statistical test that we use to see if there is any relationship pattern between two numerical variables right so two numerical variables but it is correlation is not similar with regression analysis so what she's trying to show is what are the factors that cause or affect practice of sunlight exposure not just to see their correlation she's interested in a more of uh, a causal relationship right so a one directional causal relationship to, to see the factors that are associated with it so Hermes is saying that you could have used Pearson correlation to see the relationship between knowledge and practice. As an additional uh, analysis, she can do it, but she chose to classify the variables into good and poor for both knowledge and practice. So at this point, uh, she's using categorical variables, but as an additional um, statistical uh, analysis to see if there is any pattern between knowledge, attitude, and practice, she can use Pearson correlation. Uh, by keeping the variables as numerical variables, I think she can use that. And scattered, we use uh, scattered data. Yeah, Pearson correlation is for numerical variables, which satisfy the assumption of normality. Uh, okay, these are, these are nice questions, by the way. Thank you very much uh, for bringing this up. I am kind of defending Dr. Zion. I'm not even giving her the opportunity to reflect on this. So if you have anything to say, Dr. Zion, um, you can say that for the sake of time. Uh, the post this link is uh, shared on the chat box, but you can continue dropping your questions. So we'll keep uh, the session open for five more minutes till you finish the post test. In the meantime, you can drop your questions on the chat box. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abata, and thank you, Dr. Zion, for your nice presentation. Dr. Abata, do you have anything to add? No, um, it was very interesting. I, I was uh, very happy. To join you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, 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 thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great night, everyone.